right, maybe we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. Um, and people can uh, trickle in as I do a few introductory remarks. So um, my name is Donna Shillington. I'm from Northern Arizona University and I'm excited to be convening this uh, poster session, Imaging Volcanoes and Rifts. Uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to um, check out already some of the uh, fabulous posters um, in our session. Um, and you can see the um, presenters of those uh, listed on the bottom of the screen. Um, I also wanted to emphasize that there's a number of um, posters on, um, on this topic that are in the open posters session. Um, uh, so, and those were uh, for posters where there wasn't like an associated uh, oral presentation. So I encourage you to go and, uh, and check those out too. Um, so yeah, we have an hour together today. Um, and our plan is that we'll have um, brief presentations from um, each of the uh, authors of the posters in our section. So around um, three minutes, if you go wildly over, I'll, uh, I'll start to interject. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have some time for um, questions about the talks or, um, or other uh, discussion. So um, if you could just maybe hold off on any um, oral questions during the presentations, although you can begin to put them in the um, chat. If you do have a question, I think it'll be easier for me to manage if you just indicate that you want to ask someone a question in the, in the chat rather than uh, raising your hand. And that'll help me keep track of the, uh, of the order. So our um, plan for today are to hear from, um, from these uh, six uh, folks about their, about their research. And um, yeah, and then we'll move on to questions and uh, comments. So um, with that, I will we'll get started with uh, Emily Hooft, who's an associate professor in, um, at Oregon. And uh, I'll, you can take it away, Emily. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to tell you about the Proteus uh, study, and the goal of this study is to understand the magma plumbing structure of a volcano at high resolution. And uh, so um, here uh, today I'm going to focus on how a magma system is reset and how it's rebuilt after a catastrophic mass removal and collapse event. And so we chose Santorini Volcano in the Hellenic Arc of the Eastern Mediterranean for two reasons. The first is that the volcano is very well studied. Um, 4,000 years ago, it underwent caldera collapse during a large explosive Plinian eruption. And the volcano remains active uh, with eruptions building islands at the center of the caldera and most recently, a subsurface intrusion of magma that happened in 2011-2012. Uh, the second reason is that the volcano is semi-submerged um, and this allows us to use marine seismic techniques to get unusually dense seismic coverage of an arc volcano. Uh, so in this experiment on the upper right you can see um, the circles are the seismometers. We used 90 uh, OBSIP short period instruments and 30 German land stations on the islands. Uh, and uh, we collected uh, 14 and a half thousand air gun shots from the Marcus Langseth, and that's along the uh, red lines or dots. Um, and this data set uh, gives more than 2 million event station pairs, and so it's eight times larger than the active source part of the IMUSH experiment on Mount St. Helens. Um, the main findings uh, described in the poster slides are uh, first that structures generated by the caldera collapse influence upper crustal magma recharge. Uh, and so we found a low velocity column of porous rocks uh, that's confined only beneath the north central portion of the caldera. And that's the gray region in this uh, cartoon like figure on the left. Um, and comparison with the detailed geological studies available at Santorini shows that this is a collapse column that formed during the first half of the Plinian eruption. Um, and below that, uh, the red zone, we image another low velocity body. And this is located directly below the collapse column and it's uh, interpreted as the uppermost magma body. Uh, it coincides both uh, in map location and in depth with uh, the much smaller recent magma intrusion. Um, 
And secondly, in pink, you can see um, that magmatic tectonic interactions are shaping the shallow magma system. And so low velocities consistent with a, a magma mush zone extend to the northeast, uh, where um, perhaps in the map you can see there's a volcanic the active uh, large seamount with a crater at the top and also a line of seafloor volcanic cones. And this northeast trend is parallel to large normal faults uh, that you can also see in the map and that are formed by regional extension. Can you do the next slide, Donna? Okay, and so um, the results show that a couple of things. Um, it's only a short time after a caldera forming eruption, 4,000 years. And yet the shallow crust is still conducive to storing a significant amount of melt. This is interesting in terms of the rebuilding and thermal budget. The top right figure summarizes uh, the progressive collapse of the caldera and how the broken column of rock forms. And this uh, interpretation ex explained in detail in the poster slides. Uh, and the bottom right figure shows the unloading of the edifice uh, by caldera collapse and how this reorients stresses so that melt concentrates under the northern caldera basin. So this means that there's a feedback between caldera collapse and then subsequent magma emplacement, uh, which then of course controls where caldera collapse happens in the future. And this means that the location of magma storage is likely to prevail through repeated Plinian eruption cycles, forming like a centralized volcanic system. Uh, in addition, uh, magmatic tectonic interactions shape how a portion of the melt in the system is organized. And I uh, look forward to more discussion. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, our, um, our next presentation will be given by Oceane Poix. Um, she is just finishing up a postdoc um, at Infermier and will be soon or already starting a, a new postdoc at uh, Montpellier. And, um, and so I will hand it over to you, Oceane. So, sorry, I forgot to, not, to be not muted. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Donna, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to uh, this um, uh, session. I present you here a short overview of my work that I conduced on the East Offshore Mayotte uh, volcanic plumbing. Since May 2018, a seismic crisis is striking uh, Mayotte Island with a maximum of 5.8 uh, magnitude. And this is leading the inhabitants to sleep outside at the beginning of the crisis because of the fear. Following this seismic crisis, uh, numerous of um, um, oceanog oceanographic campaign uh, were uh, conduced, and this led to uh, the location of a seismic uh, cluster to, uh, um, at 10 kilometers from um, the coast of uh, Mayotte, at the east offshore, and at the discovery of a new volcanic edifice at 50 kilometers uh, from the coast, at the end of a north 130 degrees uh, volcanic ridge. So uh, the aim of uh, my work was to define what the volcanic uh, plumbing looks like and because it was totally uh, unknown uh, before and only few uh, stations were on uh, Mayotte uh, before the crisis. And we used the um, several uh, OBSs uh, from, from numerous uh, oceanographic cruises to conduce uh, local passive tomography. So next slide, please. So from our uh, results, uh, I present you here a 3D overview of a VPVS ratio equal to 1.71. Uh, the figure B, it's a view from the top and with uh, Mayotte uh, at the at your left, 
and um, C, it's a view from, uh, from the south. The red uh, triangle, it's the new uh, volcanic edifice. So what we discover from uh, the local passive tomography, it's an old crystallized uh, pass, uh, which the distribution is clearly constrained by uh, the regional tectonic. Uh, we also uh, highlight uh, two or three potential uh, magmatic chamber with a VPVS ratio uh, higher than 1.8 and uh, north one um, 30 degrees anomaly align or parallel to the one uh, to the north 130 degree uh, volcanic uh, ridge from uh, the seafloor surface. So this um, uh, this was the first or this is the first uh, physical and structural uh, image of the volcanic plumbing of this area and it's helped to understand the new and old uh, pathways. It provides a uh, context for other fields and could be and has been compared with petrology, GPS and earthquake locations and it's going to be a baseline for the current state of the system. So for more details, please, you can read uh, my poster or you may listen a five minute video of my profile if you don't have time. Do not hesitate to ask me some questions. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much. All right, our, um, our next presentation will be given by Bhargav Budapali, who is um, currently a postdoc at, at um, the Institute for Geophysics at UT Austin, um, but recently finished his PhD at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton. So, Bhargav, take it away. Thank you, Donna. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the nature of the crust and mantle in Deep Valley Shear Margin, and uh, I'll be basing my results uh, on a velocity model developed from 3D full waveform inversion. Next slide. So, uh, Deep Valley Shear Margin is a magma pearl margin uh, no, no evaporites and very thin sedimentary covers, hence it's a very good place to study, understand rifting mechanics. Uh, the, in the figure, the, the study region is shown as a G3D and uh, towards landwards of it is Galicia interior basin where the crust is a little thicker than deep Galicia margin. And uh, across the study region, uh, a seismic section is shown uh, with the pre and synref packages marked crystalline crust and the detachment fault called S reflector and towards west it is periodic ridge. Next slide please. Uh, in 2013 uh, there was a multi uh, coincident uh, concurrently I mean multi-channel and ocean bottom seismic data were recorded concurrently and the, uh, uh, the, the circles in the figure shows OBSS the ones in green are were used for full waveform inversion and, and also the ones in pink, uh, well, while the ones in yellow were not used because of some uh, good data quality or uh, large misfits. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here are the results. Uh, the first panel shows the thickness of the crystalline crust. Uh, we tried to understand the nature of the crust. So we, uh, we randomly choose uh, five profiles and we plotted the uh, five, five locations and we plotted the velocity profiles from these locations. Uh, from both full waveform inversion model and travel time model, along with the top of the crystalline crust and also the S reflector. Uh, we didn't see any evidence for uh, a separate uh, upper and lower crust uh, based on the velocity gradients. However, we see that the velocity, velocity ranges of the crystalline crust uh, span the velocities of both upper and lower crust from Galicia inter interior basin, indicating that the crust here comprises of both upper and lower crust. Next, next slide, please. Uh, another interesting thing which we observed when we overlaid the uh, velocity profiles on seismic sections is that uh, along with the interpretations from Limer et al, uh, we see that uh, within the foot walls of the fault blocks, uh, the velocity is shallow up, indicating that there is some kind of uh, exhumation and we interpreted this as an uh, exhumation of lower crust during extension, so, which is ductile in nature. So uh, to accommodate the extension, the lower crust exhumes under the foot foot walls. Uh, this is how we interpret it. Next slide, please. 
And based on our velocity model, we developed a serpentinization map uh, of the region and we plotted the fault intersections. And we tried and we observed that uh, the first serpentinization map from full waveform inversion ma matches very well with the with the topography of the S, indicating that uh, serpentinization process played a very important role in shaping the surface of the S. And we compared our model, our, our map with a previously published uh, uh, map of serpentinization, which was developed uh, by Scuba et al. And uh, we, our interpretation uh, about the serpentinization process uh, differs from theirs. And we interpret that serpentinization process commenced during rifting and it continued into the post rifting phase. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm done. Great, thank you so much. That's great. Um, our next talk will be given by Colin Brandel, who's a PhD student at the University of New Mexico. Take it away, Colin. Yeah, hi everyone. Hi everyone. Um, a quick rundown about some of our a long strike um, tomography results from the Eastern North American margin. Uh, next slide. So we looked at two lines from the ENAM community seismic experiment uh, that were oriented uh, parallel to the margin within the peak of the East Coast magnetic anomaly. Uh, we did refraction travel time tomography with the OBSs um, using the air gun shots from the Langsip. And our most significant result are the two lower velocity gaps in the high velocity lower crust, um, where the velocities only reach between 6.9 and 7 kilometers per second. Uh, we find that those gaps are coincident to dips in the gravity anomaly and coincident to the uh, extrapolations of the cane fracture zone and the northern cane fracture zone. Uh, next. And we found that if you look at the 1D average velocity profile of those HVLC gaps, that it almost is, it's almost identical to the lower continental crust from the Atlantic coastal plain. Um, and we looked at some mantle melting models, and we found that the crust with HVLC um, has to represent very heavily intruded continental crust that it can't be fully igneous. Um, and to explain this a long strike variability between heavily intruded continental crust and basically unintruded continental crust, um, we found this model based in fracture zone formation where along the continental rift, you would have uh, magmatic centers or segments that eventually transitioned to seafloor spreading. And as they did that, they would trap continental crust between them as the form of a crustal bridge. And then as those segments uh, expanded and formed a stable mid-ocean ridge, um, that crustal bridge would basically jut out farther seaward, um, which is what we think we're actually imaging here, that uh, there is the structure at the margin, which is directly related to the segmentation of the ridge. And I'm happy to talk about this more. I could talk about it forever. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Colin. Thanks for resisting the temptation. I'm sure it would be interesting. All right, our, uh, our next speaker is um, Maylene uh, Kidawella uh, from University of Washington. So go ahead and take it away. Hello. Um, all right. Um, I'm a second year grad student at the University of Washington, and my study mainly focuses on understanding the volcano, Oka volcano, located within the Bransfield Basin, Antarctica. Um, next slide. Uh, Bransfield Basin uh, is a Bangkok basin uh, located north of the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, with, and it has a, a rift within it uh, that goes northwest, uh, northeast to southwest. Um, and it has it is located in the continental crust, and the subduction to the north of it is currently ceasing. Um, the Bransfield uh, Volcano Seismology Experiment itself is a basin-wide experiment uh, to understand the active extension of this basin. Uh, but my experiment only focuses on this uh, uh, the small yellow square on the left image. Next slide. Uh, so uh, what you see here, uh, so this area has gotten a lot of attention recently uh, due to a massive volcanic swarm uh, so in the surrounding area of the Oka volcano. Um, and um, here it's supposed to be a video, but uh, uh, I think it's not playing. 
but uh, it is uh, simply um, you can uh, look at that in my poster session. Uh, so this area has been a lot of uh, attention. And we have gotten a lot of attention as a result. The Oka volcano tomographic experiment has a, a subset of the Oka tomographic experiment, um, and it is um, this subset, and it is uh, it contains uh, fifteen OBSs. Um, so the, the actual geometry of the OBS stations and the OBSs are right there. Um, next slide. So this record section is uh, tomographic. Uh, it shows the tomography shots uh, within a line and it is flattened using the initial velocity model. Then I proceeded uh, to invert these uh, P-wave travel times uh, from the tomography shots to obtain a velocity model. Next slide. So our, prelimin uh, our preliminary results indicated a um, at 0 0.6 kilometer depth, we are seeing a low velocity um, zone uh, beneath the caldera. And it is, uh, we in it is indicative of uh, fractured rocks um, and also in the four corners, we do see low velocity zones, uh, which is which we think is uh, the uh, thick sediment present there. Next slide. Uh, so at 1.4 kilometers depth, our preliminary results do indicate that there are low velocity zones are shifting towards the northeastern side, but we are uh, not completely sure whether this is uh, magma yet. Uh, next slide. So at deeper depths at 2.8 kilometers, we do see a linear low velocity feature that is uh, very rift-like and, uh, um, and that is consistent with the area of interest. Um, next slide. So I do uh, look forward to continuing the modeling efforts of this volcano and uh, to obtain a suitable velocity model that will explain uh, the science behind it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. That's great. Um, and then our, uh, our final talk will be from Osamu, uh, who is from a, who is a postdoc at NIED in uh, Japan. So take it away, Osamu. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Good morning from Japan. I am Osamu, a postdoc researcher in NIED. Our poster title is Unexpected Tsunamis Generated by Volcanic Earthquakes at the San Marin Sumis Caldera, Japan. So this study was done in my PhD project in the University of Tokyo, collaborated with the authors listed here. So now let me introduce our poster. So at the Sumis Caldera, which is a submarine volcano, on the East Bonin Ridge, south of Japan, uh, non -double cup, peculiar non-double couple earthquakes with seismic magnitude about five repeated almost every 10 years. It is very strange that these earthquakes generated an unexpected tsunamis despite their intermediate size seismic magnitude. For example, after the 2015 earthquakes, the uh, about 60 centimeter tsunami was observed at an island that was away, uh, 180 kilometer away from the epicenters. So far, several models has been proposed for these earthquakes, but there was no sort model that explains uh, both tsunami and seismic data together. Hence, in this study, we analyzed the uh, remote observations of tsunamis and seismic waves to. Uh, both uh, no, of the 2015 earthquakes to explore the unknown earthquakes mechanism. Okay, next, next please. As a result, we successfully obtained the fault strip distribution model that quantitatively explains the different data sets. The model, uh, which is shown on the left, shows that at the timing of the earthquakes, a part of an intercalder ring fault ruptured by about three meters in the reverse fault sense. In addition, the model also shows that a horizontal crack at the depth of about two kilometers practically opened on one side and closed on the other side. This model demonstrates that a large asymmetric upward motion on the, of the caldera host rock, uh, which is shown on the schematic illustration on the right, and this pushed up the water crumb and then tsunami was generated. Based on this model, we interpret the earthquake's mechanism as so-called trapdoor faulting. That is an abrupt rupture of the ring fault 
which is induced by highly pressurized magma in a shallow crack-like magma chamber. Chopta faulting was theoretically discovered at the Sierra Negra caldera on the Galapagos Islands, uh, but its observation had been reported only at the air subaerial caldera so far. So, as far as we know, this is the first evidence of tropidor halting under the ocean. And in our posture, we also discussed why tropidor halting under the ocean can efficiently generate tsunamis. We consider its very shallow depths, complex fault system, and its abnormally large sweep for magnitude of five earthquakes contributed to the unexpected tsunamis. So that's all. I am looking forward to getting many feedbacks from you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. You're muting, Dura. Yep. Yes, only a year in. I'm gonna carry on with my amateur mistakes. Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, so now we'll uh, open it up to questions. If you could uh, type them into the... Uh, the chat, then we can uh, come to them in the in the order that they uh, that they roll in. All right. While we wait for uh, for all of you to think of your questions, I I had one for um, for Bargov. Uh, there's beautiful images of the um, velocity structure across Galicia. It's really great to um, see that. It looked like maybe I I, I missed saw, but it looked like you had a a decrease in crustal velocities as you went seaward towards the vertitite ridge. Like you had higher velocities landward and lower velocities seaward. And I was curious if that was a, maybe it was just happened to be in that particular image or if that was a, um, a more, yeah, a more general feature of the model. And if so, what you, what you thought of it? Uh, that is probably because the crustal thickness is decreasing uh, towards the periodite ridge. So it's more of the sediments towards, I mean, more of the pre and syn rift, I mean, the sediment lake column. And probably that is the reason why uh, the velocities are decreasing towards the periodite ridge in the shallower sections, whereas the, the, the high, higher velocities are in this area within the, within the mantle and the periodite ridge. Okay. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, yeah. all right, we have some questions coming in. So, um, first, uh, Ginny Collier has a question for Colin. Uh, so, hi, Colin. Um, I mean, as I'm sure you you know, in the North Atlantic, we have there's a lot of controversy about the origin of these high velocity lower crustal bodies and whether or not they are pre existing before breakup. So, I'm very interesting interested that you have a pattern that relates to the seafloor spreading fabric. So I guess my question is, is in order to confirm that they're magmatic, do you get a reduction in SDRs above them? So in other words, as you go across your um, transform faults? That's actually really interesting. We, we kind of have, um, and there's a better figure of this on my full poster, where on the southern, so southern of the of those two lines are based, there's two lines that we did and they're stitched together at the intersection point. So south of Cape Hatteras, it seems like where we have, or there, it doesn't seem like there's any, um, the SDRs and the high velocity lower crust, there's no real correlation between the two. Or right, let's see if Donna can, oh. it'll be easier if I look at it. <laughs> Does that help? Am I on the slide that you'd You're like? on the wrong screen though. You're showing your email. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, how fabulous. Let's uh, stuff all sorts of exciting things in there, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, good. Desktop two. Okay, there we go. Maybe maybe this will be more useful to you than my um, email. You know, so uh, above the, the, the southern gap that's adjacent to the cane fracture zone, we seem to find it there's a pretty still significant uh, significantly thick section of SDRs. Above the other gap that's closer to the northern, there's the thinnest or almost no SDRs. So it it doesn't seem like it seems like they're both maybe correlated and anti-correlated. <laughs> and we're still trying to figure out what that actually um, means. Hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Maybe I'll come by and talk to you, your poster. 
Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so it looks like next up is uh, John Seppi who has a question for Samu. Hi, yes, Samu. I enjoyed your, uh, your talk uh, introduction. Uh, uh, basically, the uh, uh, ring faults uh, often are associated with ring dikes, and, and actually they can become gigantic, even hundreds of meters across, in some cases, uh, accumulatively. And so I'm just wondering if if there was any uh, intrusion of magma, extrusion associated with this event on the uplifting side, where you might expect some uh, magma to be actually actively injecting during this event. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Can I uh, share my slides? Okay. Yes, of course. I think uh, if we see the, yeah, you are talking about the dike intrusion to the surface at the caldera. So That's we right. can see, yeah. So we can see the like uh, rubber cones on the caldera floor. As you can see, I think uh, it's better to see here. So there are some uh, several cones on the caldera sea floor. So we can say that uh, in long term, uh, there is actually the uh, magma intrusion along the ring fault. But uh, actually, we did we don't know when, how and when it occurred, uh, especially at the earthquake, at earthquake timing, we don't know information about the seismic one. So we do not know it's uh, associated with the, this event or later or before the earthquakes. Did I answer correctly? Oh, okay, fascinating. Uh, uh, okay. Really nice work, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. So um, next up, uh, Emily had a question for Ocean, I think. Yeah, Ocean, uh, very interesting results in a complicated magmatic system. I guess I was curious, uh, I didn't quite follow whether the VPVS, you're looking at high VPVS, and uh, for the um, frozen magma pathways, you're also interpreting those to have high VPVS, and I was wondering, is that correct and why is that the case? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so what, uh, what I did for, uh, for explain that this could be crystallized magma past is that I compare this uh, VPVS ratio with the local mean VPVS ratio of the area, which is uh, equal to only 1.66 and which is quite slow and which is explained uh, by potentially uh, fractures or fluids uh, in, in, the, uh, in the area. Uh, so I consider that everything is uh, higher or lower as this VPVS mean uh, could be an um, um, ah, sorry, I forgot the word. Could, could be an anomaly. And uh, uh, so this for the potential crystallized uh, uh, magma. And uh, for higher VPVS ratio, I have like three area with a VPVS ratio higher than 1.8 and can, can reach some sometimes 1.92. And uh, this is correlated with high, uh, sorry, with low, um, with low VS and with uh, low, v, low VP sometimes and, low, and or high VP, it depends of, uh, of the uh, area. And uh, the depth of this area, uh, of this um, potential or that I interpret as a magma chamber, uh, corresponding to to depths uh, find by petrological data uh, from geobarometry uh, data uh, in this area. I hope I answer to your question. So, for the frozen magma pathways, what were the characteristics of those? So, I just. Uh, um, it was like this, uh, 
uh, I choose a, a VPVS ratio equal to 1.71. And um, I also compare the, um, this path to the bathymetric reliefs and some of these paths just go direct uh, beneath some bathymetric relief. And, and uh, for uh, VS and VP, it depends on the area. It's quite heterogeneous, but so it's, it's not a big uh, anomaly. It's uh, uh, much more clear when uh, we are only looking to the VPVS ratio. OK, thank you. Right, uh, I believe Brandon is next and had a question for Colin. Hey Colin, uh, yeah, awesome talk, really appreciate it. It's definitely really cool to see that along strike line. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, so yeah, the, the along strike changes in the velocity structure are super interesting. I think definitely an awesome argument for the inheritance of fracture zones in the later stages. Um, I'm wondering, it looked like the crustal thickness was kind of constant along the profile. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about um, what that might mean. Uh, I guess I would think like the areas that had more magmatic additions might be a little bit thicker and then the stuff where the gap was is maybe more extended. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so broadly you're right. They are relative, it is, re the thickness is relatively consistent. Um, on my whole poster, I have a, um, a figure and actually it looks like uh, this, the, the HPLC gaps, those regions actually have slightly thicker crust. And I'm still unsure if that's just the velocity depth trade-off or that might be a real signal. Um, I think regardless with how consistent the thickness is, that <laughs> um, put me on the spot, Brandon, this is like a good question. I'm Still trying to think about. Um, in my mind, the right the entire rifted crust was the same thickness, so we're just intruding into that and laying the basalt flows on top of it, and that shouldn't, in my mind, shouldn't have that much of an effect. Maybe, regardless of how much we're actually intruding, um, and then the gaps are just unintruded crust with the flows on top if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, super interesting. All right, any other questions or comments? I had one for Ocean, actually. It's more of a background question, but what causes the magnetism on Mayotte? And is it related to the volcanoes that are on Madagascar? And I've always been, I haven't read enough about that area, so I've always been curious about the origin of that magnetism. This is a good question because in fact, we don't really know because it, wa it wasn't really studied before and because it was quite calm area. And, um, and there is some hypothesis about hotspots, uh, but it's not really correlated with plate motion and so on. So uh, now there are new apotheses. It's that it could be related to a, a large um, a lithosphere rifting and that can cause the magmatism. Hmm, interesting. But we don't really know if, it, if it's related to Madagascar or not. Okay. Yeah, I was curious if by age or composition, if people thought those volcanoes had a genetic link. But, okay, interesting. All right, any other questions? Comments? All right, well, maybe um, I think it's been a long day, especially for all the, uh, for everyone who's joined us from time zones where this isn't a very friendly time. So especially thanks to everyone joining us from, uh, yeah, from Europe or <laughs> parts of Asia or wherever. This is, we appreciate your uh, being on our time zone for this. Um, so we'll uh, go ahead and um, wrap it up, but hopefully we can carry on the discussion. Um, there's a chat function in Pathable to uh, ask people further questions about their posters. Definitely check them out if you haven't already. And um, 
yeah, look forward to seeing everyone at the rest of the meeting. So thanks very much. Bye, everyone.